Good morning, everybody. Find your seats, please. We got a great and full agenda. The room will be filling up as we go. <clears throat> so welcome, welcome to uh, Torrance Memorial Hospital and the Thel McMillan Center and our Frontiers in Addiction uh, lecture series. I'm Dr. Mo Gelbart, the Executive Director of the Thel McMillan Center. And uh, you know, what a perfect time two days before Thanksgiving to basically say thanks to all of you for, you know, all your support, your support to our programs, uh, to our patients, to our clients, and to this program. Uh, we wouldn't be here for 27 years without all of your assistance and confidence. So, you know, not, we give thanks and, you know, the, the, the thousands of patients that we've worked with over the years give thanks to you as well. Uh, <clears throat> I'll make our program real brief. You know, we have an adult and adolescent program, an IOP, intensive outpatient program. Uh, we are covered on our all insurance plans. We have a no charge initial assessment. Because we're with the hospital, we determine what's best for the client and we make sure they get to the right place. It's not always our place. Uh, a little ho housekeeping real quick. One is turn off your cell phones. Now would be a good time. I'll do that. And uh, if you're getting CEUs, you have to sign up in the back. Also, you have to stay till the end. Uh, you know, we're, mon well, we're monitored and, you know, believe it or not, there are even people who come around and, and see what, you know, the quality of what we're doing. So, you know, you have to stay till the end to get your certificate. Uh, bathrooms are in the back, outside to the right, and we'll have a break somewhere midway, about 10 minutes or so. Uh, one other quick question, because we're having a little trouble with our email announcements. H how many of you have been getting email announcements to these? Okay. If you have not, what I would suggest is uh, at the break or at the end, make sure that we have your email. Uh, you know, put it down on one of the sheets in the back. We're having a little trouble getting our emails out. Uh, so rather than say very much, I'm gonna, we, have, we have a new a quick video I'm going to show you which really talks about, again, gratitude and thankfulness for what we accomplish, all of us, not just here at Thel McMillan. So let's see if I can get this going. Nobody in my family, nobody knew my dirty secrets. I mean, I had hit them well. Not even my wife knew them. Um, I was coming in the house at 2 o'clock at night with my head down, hidden. So when Jim came to me and said, I have a huge drug problem, I need help, it was finally like a relief, like, oh, that's what's wrong with you. I mean, I had him diagnosed as bipolar. I even asked my boss, who's a doctor, can you give Jim some medication? He's really messed up. He's bipolar. He's schizophrenic. He's just, he's crazy. This was me being crazy, thinking I could fix him. I asked my wife if we could go to some kind of an inpatient recovery center and she said, well, let's go check out this place. And uh, we pulled up and it was Thelma McMillan Recovery Center. Um, and uh, I walked in and that's where my journey began. We felt at home the minute we walked in the door and they told me I got to go to a meeting that night, a family meeting for just family members. And I walked in that room and met Jean and met people who's loved ones were in recovery and were going through the program and it was almost like this weight had been lifted off my shoulder. I knew that I was in the right place. All of my counselors there got really personal with me. and They really were, I, I genuinely felt um, compassion from them towards me. The Thelma McMillan program, I always say, has saved both of our lives. Jim went to the program. Jim was the patient. I was a patient too. Not technically, but in my mind, I was a part of that too. I went every Friday night to the family group. I went to the Saturday morning groups. I went to the, the functions that they had. And I healed through that program. So many good things have happened. I've got to see my wife grow. Uh, we grew together. If we don't grow together, we grow apart. 
we did the footwork. We did what we had to do. We prayed a lot, but we also, you know, knew that there was there were solutions and hope, and we never lost hope. And the one thing that I would say is that there is so much hope through this process. Don't ever give up hope because it's there. You know, raise your hand and say help. And I remember when I was saying, I can't wait to get my old life back. And one of the other counselors I had there was, Jim, why do you want that old life back? Why don't you build a new life? And I'm like, oh my goodness. And I've had the opportunity to build a whole new life, which is amazing. So that tells it much better than I can. Uh, thank you. The other thing I want to, we've been putting on these programs for 20 years at least, free education to the community, uh, free breakfast, free CEUs, uh, and it's been, you know, we get, as you will see today, the best speakers in the country. And uh, we're honored that they are willing to come here. I do want to take this, you'll, you'll be first. This is our uh, lineup for 2019. I'll go through it quickly. So January, and by the way, we have flyers in the back. Pick them up and mark your calendars. You know, for those that are licensed in the various disciplines, if you come to our programs, you, you never have to do any other CEUs. You meet all your requirements for licensing. Anyway, doc, on January 15th, Dr. Stan Tatkin, The Psychology of Addiction through his PACT program. Uh, March 19th, Diana Clark with Turnbridge Recovery, The Role of Parents and Young Adults Sustaining Recovery. May 21st, Dr. Mel Pohl, one of the leading experts in uh, opiate and pill addiction from Las Vegas Recovery Center. Chronic pain and addiction, how he missed the boat. July 16th, Dr. Goldenberg, psychiatrist at Cedars and uh, some programs on the west side. Changing the culture from healthcare provider addiction, burnout and suicide to resiliency and burning brightly. I'm mostly talking about all not all of us specifically, but those of us in the healthcare field and what we struggle with often. September 17th, John Sovek, uh, LGBTQ substance abuse supporting the intricate journey. And then November 19th, Jamie Marich, Dr. Marich, mindfulness informed interventions for addiction treatment. All, as I say, great speakers, great authors, keynote speakers at every major conference and we're honored to have them. The months that we don't do these programs, we have what we call South Bay Networking, which is over at our center. And I'm just gonna give you that lineup real quick. February 26th, Anna Perkle, who's here tonight today, Use of Art Therapy and Recovery. April 23rd, Kelly Souza, Whack-A-Mole. Uh, if you don't know what that is, ask one of us later. I learned myself. Uh, June 25th, Ken Francis, The Intimacy Gram. August 27th, Patty Huber, Adoption and Trauma. And October 22nd, our Assistant Medical Director, Dr. Lichtman, on Medication Assisted Treatment. So again, another great year in 2019. Uh, want to thank, by the way, and recognize our partners, uh, the Meadows and Cheryl Camby, and she'll come up and speak a little bit. Uh, we have some of our main people that help put this on here. Dr. Watson, our Program Director is here, Jamie Gilbart's here who helps organize this, and, and Therese Lang is our intake coordinator I saw here somewhere, as well as many of our staff. Uh, finally, before I'm gonna introduce our speaker in a moment, but because of today's topic, you know, we, we also have uh, here at the hospital a excellent and unique eating disorder program, and I want to just give a few minutes to Lauren to come up and just tell you about the Torrance Memorial Eating Disorder Program, real quick. Good morning, everyone. Um, we have a program here at Torrance Memorial that is a medical stabilization program for patients with eating disorders. So we take patients that are too sick to go to treatment centers, residential, PHPs, and IOPs. Um, we typically take patients that are low weight, have other medical complications, and um, it's a pretty comprehensive program where we have individual family, individual and family therapy. Um, we don't do group therapy. They meet with the dietitian, and we help to kind of figure out where they can go next. If you are in a program and you refer to us, we'll refer them back to you. But um, otherwise, we work with a lot of the programs in the area, and um, 
we can help you guys get them medically stable to be able to do the work at your center. Thank you. I forgot one other thing. There's also a conference in January 24th to 27th. There are flyers in the back, Evolution of Addiction. Uh, it's been taken over by C4, which puts on all these large programs throughout the country, and it's gonna be an excellent program. We have flyers in the back. We have, we, we can give you a $100 discount. Thel Mc, uh, the McMillan Family Foundation is the major sponsor of the program. And if you are interested in going, you can get a $100 <laughs> discount. Just make sure you see myself or Jamie or Dr. <laughs> Watson. I have to give you a code that they forgot to print on there. So if you're interested in going, pick up a flyer and see us. So let me introduce our speaker today. Uh, and <clears throat> in addition, being you know, one of the most influential people in this field, uh, just on a personal note, I'm gonna take a moment. You know, she, we didn't know this was gonna go on today. We, we didn't know exactly what our backup plan was because Carolyn lives in Malibu. And I think it was, she'll tell you, but it was just yesterday or something that the, the road opened. So what I'm really impressed with is her willingness to come, but how much in touch she was with us and, and concerned and committed to doing this for us and for all of you guys, and I, I really appreciate, you know, her just working so hard to do that. We will, from at Thel McMillan Center, make a donation in her name to one of the funds that that are working with the victims of that fire. So uh, let me introduce our speaker. <clears throat> Carolyn Costin is a world-renowned, highly sought-after eating disorder clinician, author, and international speaker. Recovered from anorexia in her 20s, as a young therapist, Carolyn recognized her calling after successfully treating her first eating disorder client. Carolyn was first to publicly take the position that people with eating disorders can become fully recovered. After 15 years in private practice and running programs, Carolyn was determined to improve the relapse rate and recognize the gap in the eating disorder field. She opened Montanito, the first residential facility in a home setting surrounded by nature where standard treatment was combined with meditation and yoga and clients were retrained to shop, prepare, and cook food. Her contributions to the field are extensive. Her six books service in every major eating disorder organization, three decades of training professionals worldwide, free study groups, and the outstanding success of Montanito all spurred Carolyn to international acclaim. In 2016, Carolyn left Montanito and created the Carolyn Costin Institute, offering continuing education for clinicians, eating disorder coach, and mentor training, speaking, consulting, and supervision. She's an active, passionate, inspiring force in the eating disorder field. Uh, we have her email. Hopefully, she'll put it up. If not, we'll give it to you. And again, help me welcome one of the true pioneers in this field. Thank you so much. It's so interesting to hear someone talk about you like that. <laughs> I, don't, I haven't gotten over it. I have a couple little things I have to do up here. So hold on one second. Oh, it's actually nice to be here because um, for 12 days I was in the evacuation zone and we never left our house. And so this is, um, it opened yesterday, he's correct. And um, it, it, I told my friend Gwen, I stayed at her house last night so I'd be sure to get here this morning, that I felt like I went through a portal. You know, there's so much going on and friends have lost their homes all around me and everything. And uh, this is a portal into normalcy, you know? So it's kind of good to be here. I'm, I'm glad that it opened up. Um, and I'm glad I could be here and share this interesting talk today because it's, this is not a talk, a lot of times I really focus on training people how to treat people with eating disorders. And I think I'm gonna do that in some way. But in another way, what I'm gonna do today is talk about little pieces of um, things that we've learned from the research and how that can help us, and how we put that into practice. Um, Kurt Lewin, who was probably the first sort of real social psychologist who did all these 
attachment studies, you know, when the ducks started following him around and, and all, all those things. He, he said, if you want to truly understand something, try to change it. And I've been doing that for about 40 years. Um, first with my own illness, anorexia nervosa, and then as I tried to help other people. And I, th I think that this really does mean something. When you're in the trenches, um, first trying to change your own way of thinking, it, when you know it's kind of distorted, and then trying to help other people. So I always, I came across that and thought that was such a good way to think about it. Um, and I wanted to share with you my first experience of how research informs clinical practice. About 15 years into my private practice as a therapist, I sent out to every client I had ever seen a survey. I should have saved it. I should have had a peer review. I didn't really know about those things then or wasn't paying much attention. But I asked a ton of questions. And what came out of the stacks of paperwork was that about of all the people who were recovered, no more symptoms, weight gain, no more purging, no laxatives, period, back, everything, about 85% of them reported that they journaled, reported that they were not weighing, and these were questions that I had asked, and reported that um, they attributed working with someone who was recovered was a significant aspect to their getting better. So I had been a high school teacher for eight years before um, going into full-time practice as a therapist, and so I became, you know, I did what you're supposed to do is I, you know, taught to the test, <laughs> in, in, in other words. Ever since I got that, got that report back and got this information back, every single client that walked through my doors, I taught them to do those three, those, those three things. And then, of course, I was recovered and I ended up um, hiring a lot of people who were recovered to work with the clients. And the thing about it is journaling gets them to get it out of their head onto paper, especially you'll see when we want them to challenge their thoughts. Um, not weighing is a really big deal. It, it kind of goes against some of the other things that people do in treatment. Um, but I think it's a huge thing, getting them off the scale, not knowing numbers, not focusing on numbers. It takes a lot to get them to do that but I think it's huge. And then reaching out um, for help, these are people who often will say, you know, oh, it's on I only lost one pound, or I only, you know, just skipped my snack, or I just, you know, purged once. Um, you know, I can do it myself, it's not that bad. And so teaching them that the first sign of getting off the track, you have to reach out and you have to ask for help. You have to get back, back on track again. So I'm, not, I'm gonna not really talk much, a little bit, but not much about the evidence-based treatments for eating disorders. There's CBT for bulimia nervosa, and there's FBT for um, adolescents with anorexia, but there's some caveats to that, you know? Um, they're changing with the different research that's happening, but mostly it's um, for people with anorexia who are 17 and under, a BMI not below 75, uh, I think it is, duration of illness, three years. By the time that study came out, I remember saying, well, give me those clients, because I had already been seeing clients who were, um, had gone far, uh, far beyond that. And so it's important to know the evidence-based treatments, and you can learn that somewhere else, but um, really, they don't work. We need a lot more than that. That's what I want to say. We need a lot more than evidence-based treatments, and if you're clinicians and all that, you know that. Um, CBT, for example, only works about 50% of the time. And I love this quote by um, this guy, Norcross, um, who said, it's not just what kind of disorder the patient has, but what kind of patient has the disorder. And you know, there's a a debate that is still ongoing is eating, are eating disorders, is it a brain disease, is it genetic, is it an addiction? I stick to the term disorder, by the way, and I think by the end of the presentation you'll, you'll have an understanding why I do that. I don't call it a disease, I don't call it an addi addiction, partly because I believe you can be fully, fully recovered from it, where you're not dealing with it forever, one day at a time, whatever. So what are the things we see when we see someone who has an eating disorder? And I'm gonna show you a clip 
It's a, um, a clip that some people in this room have probably seen. It's a, I'm so fortunate to have taped this session with this young woman. Um, it's just so classic, anorexia nervosa. She's 23 years old, about 60 pounds, uh, had three previous hospitalizations and relapses before she came to Montanito. And we were one week into the treatment and um, she wanted to talk to me because she thought we were giving her too many calories. So I want you to notice, um, you know, when you treat someone with eating disorder, you're treating a lot of things, right? And um, you're not just, not just about food and weight. So I just want you to sort of pay attention to all these things and maybe especially um, me looking for what I call her healthy self. And also my affect. I'm very struck by this every time I see it because I was really worried about this girl. I mean, you know, 60 pounds. It, it was pretty uh, <laughs> risky. We were the, were the only residential around at that time. Anyway, so I took the case. But I look really calm. <laughs> but, but inside, there's a lot. And I was calm, but there's a lot going on. And we'll talk about it afterwards. OK. Pounds, but how do, you, how do you account for the fact that you didn't gain any weight? So that means you're not getting too many calories, at least. But um, I just think it's getting really scary for me. Yeah, I think so, too. Like the food and like yeah. the... Is there anything that would make it less scary that we could do? I don't know. I just feel like I'm going to start restricting again. Mm -hmm. Well, let's talk about that because I'm interested in that. What happens in your head when you want to start restricting? What is it that you're uh, afraid is going to happen? I just feel out of control. Like the whole exchange system is like so out of control of me. Like, I don't know. I just feel out of control. Well, what does that mean, out of control? That you're um, that you're not going to be able to stop at this level you're at right now? That you're going to want more and more? Is that what you think? No, I just feel like my body is just going out oh. of control, and the food and shakes and just everything is out of control. Seems like so much. Like all of a sudden, I'm like all shakes. I want all shakes. Like I want it. Like because shakes are a little more precise. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's precise. Mm -hmm. Stuff. Same thing every day, Same and you thing. can count on it. Yeah, I understand that. I think it's a little bit regression. It's a little bit going backwards. If you did that, I think. Mm, I hope we don't have to do that, but sometimes we have to do that. You know, um, maybe we can have some other things that are a little more precise. I I don't know, because I don't think anyone's trying to fool you or trick you or anything. Because. The proof is going to be what happens in your body, no matter what, you know what I mean? And what happens in your body, we have a deal, I have to tell you if it happens. Maybe, I don't know, and 70 seems like such a huge number to me. Hmm, that's interesting, isn't it? Well, why do you think 70 seems huge? Like when you weighed 120, did 70 seem huge? I never weighed 120. When you weighed 110? I don't know what you weighed. What's the most you ever weighed? Like 107. Oh, okay. So I'm, I'm saying the wrong things. No, it doesn't Okay, when you weighed 107, didn't 70 seem like for really skinny no. anorexic people? Oh, I don't know. Can't remember. I don't know. It just seems like 70 seems like a lot here. Here? Yeah. At Montanito? Why here? I don't know. It hmm. just seems like a lot. Maybe because it's changing from sixes you know, to sevens. Maybe it's going up a whole range or something, and that sounds big. I don't know. It just seems like a lot of weight. I don't know. I guess ultimately I'm just trying to weasel my way out of things, and I my eating disorder is really, really bad right now, I guess. Mm -hmm. Well, what's it saying? Don't eat, don't eat, don't eat, don't eat. Get out of there, get out of there. Does just it die. tell you why? Does it I tell you why know. not to eat? You don't know why? Doesn't give you any reasons. Is it? Does it tell you, you don't deserve to eat, or does yeah. it does? And and does it tell you why you don't deserve no, to eat? No, I don't know. So what do you say back to it? Do you ever say anything back to it when it says that? When it tells you not to eat, is there anything you can say back? 
Well, well, let's take Heather for example. Tall Heather. You know, hers tells her not to eat too. What would you tell her? And sometimes it's easier when you try to work on how you would help somebody else. When, when, when her eating disorder starts saying don't eat, don't eat, and only shakes are safe, can you imagine what you might say to her? To help her? Okay, so I stopped it because I, I don't know if you can see her smile there. This to me is the most significant part of this tape because what I'm doing is looking for her healthy self and they cannot bring it out for themselves, um, but they can bring it out for other people. So her friend Heather, who's also a restrictor, what would you say to Heather? You've all seen this if you've worked with people with eating disorders. So she goes like this. What would you say to Heather? She puts her head down, you know, and then says, um, you need it. And that's where you build on. Of course, you know, she knows what I'm gonna say next. I'm gonna go through that uh, in a minute, but I, I wanted to say also, it goes on and, and I explained to her, well, I wanna stick up for that part of you. I wanna stick up for the part of you that knows that, for the part of you that I've heard about while you can't stick up for yourself right now. Because at this point, she, that's all she is, sort of like a walking, um, walking eating disorder. So what are various elements that you see in this video that you know you're probably gonna have to treat? Just throw some out. <laughs> okay, her self-esteem. Being, being out of control, for sure, yeah. The numbers, which is about kind of in the same line about control, body image, body image. Um, anxiety. You can see, you know, how anxious she is. Anyway, I, I, I made a list. Control, harm avoidance when she's like, I want shakes, all shakes, very precise, you know. Um, issues of trust and safety. Uh, she started with saying, you guys are giving me, you know, too many calories. And then this concept of eating disorder self, healthy self. So I'm gonna talk about these issues that are listed up here and what some of the research has shown us about anxiety and harm avoidance and body image and things like that. Um, but before I do that, I wanna go a little bit further into this concept of healing I have about eating disorder self, healthy self, that every single client who walks in my office has a healthy core self that was there before the eating disorder self developed. So I say to her, um, I mean, she says, my eating disorder is just really, really bad right now. Now, when you have this philosophical stance that I, that I have and that I teach about looking for the helping clients understand the difference between their eating disorder self and their healthy self, what do you say when someone says that? My eating disorder is just really, really bad right now. Does anyone remember what I said? Well, what's it saying? I instantly start to separate the eating disorder from her. What's it saying, this other part of you? You know, not um, how bad is it or what are the bad things. I, whenever I get a window of opportunity, I want to start to separate the person and them being different from this other ego state that's developed called the eating disorder self. So she says, don't eat, don't eat, don't eat. Get out, get out, get out. And it didn't take much, right, for her to get there. I mean, I asked her a couple of questions, and now she's telling me what this voice is telling her. So what do I say? Does it tell you why? Does it give you any reason why? Often at this point, there's no reason why. She's just going for it. But since usually these are highly functioning people in other areas of their lives, you know, she's getting straight A's at school, so how does this happen? Um, does it tell you why? I, I like to then ultimately point out, why are you doing something that some voice is just telling you to do, you know? Yeah. But she's at this point where, uh, you know, I don't know. So I say, you don't know why? Well, does it give you a reason? Does it tell you you don't deserve to eat? And she says, yes. 
So I say it does, and does it tell you why you don't deserve D? No, I don't know. So now I, I, I could be stuck here. Now what do I do? And this is the $64 million question that gets them to start what I call giving the ball back, which is, so what do you say back? <laughs> if it tells you that, what do you say? There's it and there's you. So what do you say back? Do you ever say anything back when it tells you not to eat? Is there anything you can say back? And she says, I don't know. And then I say, well, let's talk about that. What would you say to Heather? That I just wanted to open with that so you have that premise in the way that I work with people when we look at the other aspects of the research that I'm going to talk about. And the whole idea is about strengthening the person's healthy self so ultimately it gets back in control. I don't go in, and you can sort of see here, uh, battling with the eating disorder self. I, I, in fact, I'm really trying to, well, let's talk about that. And oh, you want things precise? And OK, I understand that. Um, because, and I don't tell people we're going to take away your eating disorder self. I, I describe to them what, I, what it is. As soon as they give me a window in, I'll point it out, describe to them, and say, we're just going to make your healthy self stronger. Ultimately, the choice is going to be yours. I don't want to get into a battle with them. I don't think it's a battle that's easy to win trying to take their eating disorder away from them. I want to strengthen the healthy part of them. And once that gets stronger, they take care of their own eating disorder. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? So the eating disorder um, is an illness you have. It's a separate ego state that's developed over time. It's not your whole identity. We want to reconnect and mobilize the part of you that's healthy, learn how to talk back to it, just and, you, and using other people and friends and family and nieces and nephews as examples. And then when the healthy self is back in control, doing all the things for you um, that, that, that the eating disorder has been doing for you, I call that integration. I call that recovered, but it's integration. They no longer have a split off eating disorder self, mm -hmm. they become integrated. So I don't talk about it as getting rid of. And I think that's helped me in my success as a therapist because I don't talk about getting rid. You get rid of the eating disorder behaviors because those aren't worth it. But you don't get rid of this part of self. That part of self was there for a reason. It becomes, I always say, it becomes your alarm system or your signal to tell you when, that something's wrong. But now your healthy self is in control and you'll deal with it in better ways. That happens to be key too in a book I wrote called Eight Keys to Recovery with Gwen Grab, who's somewhere in here. Um, but it really is the most important key, I think, in terms of helping people get well. So, so integrated or what I call recovered. But a lot of people will say, well, it's a brain disease or it's a lifelong illness. It, it's an addiction from which you will always be recovering. And that's due to the genetics, it's due to the biology that we've discovered in our genetic research and, and all that. So I want to talk about that for a few minutes. Are, are eating disorders a, a genetic illness? This is a pair of twins who've got anorexia nervosa. I've treated several twin pairs, very interesting, both fraternal and identical twins. Um, what family studies show is that there is a higher prevalence in anorexia and bulimia among relatives of um, those who have eating disorders, uh, there's a higher prevalence than control groups. So we know there's some familial, there, there's, there's some liability as a fam. Uh, if you have a, a especially a, a close relative who has it. Now then you take twin studies and you compare fraternal twins and identical twins. And if identical twins get it more, then you say, okay, then it must be Genetics are involved in that, so there's a what's called a, an added genetic factors. This is thought to be true of uh, uh, binge eating disorder, but the studies are less developed, so I can't say that much about that. But when you look closely at this gold standard, this I did comparing identical twins to fraternal twins, you see that identical if one identical twin gets anorexia nervosa, the other one gets it about 30 to 50 percent of the time. Fraternal twins get it only about 15%. So if you looked at headlines when these, um, this research first came out, 
you would see eating disorders are genetic. 83% of the cause for, e I don't know how they figured with their co-factors and numbers. I don't know how to do that. But they were saying, and, and uh, which, I, which I think is, is misleading, they were saying eating disorders are a genetic illness. So let me explain what I think about it and how I um, talk about it and how I talk to clients and families about it. Um, because what I started thinking, well, what about the other 70% of the time that the identical twin doesn't get it, or 50 to 70% of the time? If you take an illness like um, cystic fibrosis, for example, that's a genetic illness. If one identical twin gets it, the other one gets it 100% of the time. So the, one of the things that I, and I'm not going to say too much more about it, but one of the things that is different, and Gwen and I were talking about this last night, she's working with an uh, identical twin pair, is that you can't say that it's the same. So they took fraternal twins and they took identical twins and they said they're comparable. So if there's anything different, it's got to be genes. How many of you have worked with uh, a pair of twin, identical twins? Anybody? Only one. Two. Well, they're different than fraternal twins. If you look exactly like your, I mean, I was competitive with my sister. When my sister lost uh, weight for, to get into her wedding dress, I w went on a diet to lose weight because I wasn't going to have her be thinner than me. <laughs> if my sister looked exactly like me, that would have been worse. So when you have identical twins, there are other dynamics going on between them that are different than fraternal twins. And the comparison factor in people who have eating disorders, they compare themselves with everybody. And you imagine comparing yourself to someone who looks exactly like you. You are not going to be the heavy one. You are not. So, there's a, so right there, there are environmental factors, which they ruled out when they did the, the, the twin studies. And I don't think they should rule out. But there's some other things that I think about this too. And, Basically, what we found out that it's not just genes, it's, it gets very specific. Genes, alleles, certain parts, pieces of genes that influence, and, and it causes this, what we call a vulnerability or a risk factor. So what we found out in terms of anorexia nervosa is that it's like a, a temperament, and I'm sure you've heard of this. And, and, and if you've treated many people with anorexia nervosa, you've seen especially restrictor anorexia nervosa, you've seen this temperament. And this temperament style is an expression of this genes that are passed down, because you can often see it in families. And what is that? Perfectionism, a need for order, um, sensitivity to praise and reward or uh, um, harm avoidance, and basically control junkies. Does that make sense? How many people here treat people with eating disorders. I don't even know that yet, so I may be, okay. So I would say a little bit less than half. Hopefully some of the things you're gonna see uh, here today, you'll be able to, well, I'm sure, you'll be able to apply to other um, illnesses as, as well. Okay, so here's the, all these traits. Perfectionism, you saw most of those when you saw the video. So I have those genes, I admit it, when I saw people talking about it, I realized I had those genes. So I'm going to tell you a few stories. Um, this is, uh, over in the far left is me, five years old. I'm at kindergarten. It's Halloween. And, you know, my husband looks at that. My husband has that picture on his desk, and he always says when he sees that, I know that look, you know. <laughs> um, I'm really pissed because the other kids in kindergarten are not getting it right. There's my little friend Judy in her little Alice in Wonderland dress, and I'm like, Halloween is witches and ghosts and goblins, and all you kids have it wrong, and I'm bossing around the elementary school, I mean the, the kindergarten, because they were not in the lines. They were not following the rules, you know? And I'm five, and my dad, <laughs> called me bossy flossy and he said I would always I would be in the neighborhood with other kids in the neighborhood and I would say well, okay we're gonna play this game and I'm gonna say this and then you're gonna say this and then I'm gonna say this and you're gonna say this so I also you know had the traits in high school I would do things like I'd be on the 
school bus um, coming back from a game, a basketball game or something, and I'd be the kid with the flashlight reading my homework. Um, and homework, for example, when I, when I got a boyfriend that told me, oh, you know, I was working to get turn in my homework, and he said, um, I'm not turning it in. And I was like, you mean we have an option? <laughs> you know, like it didn't even occur to me that it was possible to not turn it in. So there's my journal when I had anorexia nervosa, now go to college. I have pages and pages and pages and pages of writing like that. And what's really weird about that, I've used this to show other people, if you treat someone who has anorexia nervosa, you often see this tiny little writing. And it's weird to show them this because they think, what? Like, what? And it's trying to explain to them this temperament they have, a part of their brain. It's not just a unique thing. I thought I was so unique. And in fact, sometimes when they say, you know, they're worried about um, not being special or unique anymore, I say, the more you have anorexia, the more you're like every other person with anorexia, you know, and the less you are like yourself. And then I always throw this in, um, this book, I, I was asked to write this book, 100 Questions and Answers, there's a whole series out, you know, about menopause and about back pain and about depression, and when they asked me to write the one for eating disorders, I thought it's so perfect for me, because I got to write all the questions and all the answers. <laughs> So here's the key for clinicians. Our temperaments uh, can be a liability or an asset. So in high school, I got straight A's. I also got anorexia. So it, it's, it's not really that my genes caused anorexia nervosa, but they're correlated with it. So what's important to do with our, our patients is find out what their temperament traits are and then help them to take their traits, I call it from the darkness to the light, from a liability to an asset. So um, when I first saw the researchers, several years ago at this point, putting up all the traits, per um, like perfectionism for example, I'm sitting in the audience and I thought, well I like to think of myself as tenacious. <laughs> or they said, you know, compuls compulsive, and I thought, I'm just really driven. Anxious, I like to call that energetic. And obsessive, I'm not obsessive, I'm detail-oriented. <laughs> right? You can see. You can see how, for example, we used to um, joke around, and Walter Kay, who is a, a very big researcher in temperament and, and eating disorders, would, would, was probably the first person I ever heard say, um, I like to hire people um, who had anorexia nervosa in the past because they get all their paperwork done on time, you know? Um, uh, so I've used that. Uh, but so for example, someone with bulimia nervosa has more uh, impulsivity. And what do we call that to help give it back to them in a way that um, they can use for good is spontaneous. And in Montanito, it, it, at any given time, if we were filled with um, most people with a diagnosis of anorexia, believe me, we'd be sitting around saying, please have the next person who come in have bulimia so we can have some spontaneity around here, you know? But if, they, if we had a house that was filled with people with bulimia, it was a little bit chaotic. They're more high risk taking. They're definitely more impulsive. It was like, could we get some people with anorexia? And I'd always talk about the mind meld, how they needed to learn from each other. It's why I have this uh, assignment that I ask all clients to do, how is your relationship with food like your relationship with people? Because as you're teaching somebody about their temperament, you wanna teach them uh, how it plays itself out in different ways. So you'll have someone with anorexia say, I scrutinize um, labels, I read everything before um, I eat it, I scrutinize people, I don't let many people in, I have one friend at a time, I eat one food at a time. Or my favorite one um, is the client who, who, with bulimia nervosa who said, oh I binge and purge men. And the reality was that she actually did and you'll find that they'll go through relationships and you could even ask yourself, what's my relationship to food and how is that like my relationship to people? And you will, if you really think about it, you'll see. Are you a kind of a risk taker? Do you like a lot of spicy things? <laughs> are you, 
you know, try a lot? Are you more routine and like to have the same things? It's interesting when you start looking at it. And it's nice because you can treat it from both aspects because you're treating the temperament. And so if you're working on the food or working on their relationship with people, it all uh, kind of, one affects the other. So um, you channel the treatment, for example, like taking perfectionism and um, how can you use that? You're not going to change it. It mitigates, it gets better over time, but you're not really going to change it. So how do you um, say, well, how do you put that to something that's to your benefit, like playing an instrument or something like that? Or me this morning at 5.30 a.m. looking at my slides, you know, are they right, you know? Um, and also, as Gwen continues to teach me, um, you don't have to be the best, go for the bronze, you know, go for the silver, you don't always have to go for the gold. Um, use their logic, for example, if they say um, they want to be in control, which is having willpower, uh, one of my favorite things to do is, you know, have a cookie sitting there and saying, what takes more willpower, to eat it or not eat it? I don't think you can eat it. And then they have to go like, what, uh, no, you know, because they don't, if they think that it's w willpower and control not eating it, someone with anorexia, per se, and you say to them, that's no longer willpower. That's not under your control. Your brain is now obligating you not to eat it. Does that make sense? So it's, they have to start looking at it. It's, it's um, if we use the other tactic, like, um, oh, you deserve to have cookies, or that's not going to work. You have to use their own logic sort of against them. And then there are other things like teaching affect tolerance and um, to help with impulse control, how to respond versus react, and some mindfulness things that we're going to talk about and other ways to avoid um, to deal with uh, anxiety. So I recovered, and there's thousands of other people who are now recovered. And, and the key take-home point here is, and I always would say, my genes are the same. The illness is gone. So the, the point being is to label it as a genetic illness is misleading and sometimes even damaging. I had someone show up to the treatment center when this genetic thing started happening and saying, um, I know eating disorders are genetic, so why bother? Right? So we have to educate them with the research we have and, and show them about this is how your genes are affected. It's a vulnerability. It's a risk factor. It's a temperament trait, and we can work with that. Um, a brain disorder has um, identifiable, relatively fixed pathology. You can't, for example, with cancer, you can't do CBT, you can't do behavioral things to change a, a true, what I think of as a disease. There's no behavioral component or cure. So eating disorders are actually this complex interaction of multiple genes and <coughs> environmental factors. So it's sort of like this biological vulnerability but then you put it in the context, and it's the context that actually explains the behavior. So people are kind of tired of this, you know. This is the thing we used to talk about all the time, about the models and all that. But I'm going to bring it up because it's, it's, it's important that we still consider this. Um, we still have a culture. You take a perfectionistic person and you put them in a culture like this, and what, what happens? Or you put someone who's harm avoidant, perfectionist, anxious, and you can just see it, you know, lose 10 by tomorrow. I love this one, this glamour, is your hair making you look fat? And the one on the bottom, I don't know if you ever saw it, it's a Carl's Jr. ad, and she's, that's, she's washing the car on Saturday morning. Like, <laughs> that's how I wash my car. <laughs> so, it's true, so then people say, yeah, but if dieting caused eating disorders, then everybody, all girls, you know, so many girls are on a diet. You know, 80% of fourth graders report being on a diet several years ago. Um, then everybody who diets gets eating disorders. But that's the same thing that we used to say about smoking. Actually, it's what the tobacco company said. Smoking doesn't cause cancer. Otherwise, everybody who smoked would get cancer. Well, it's a risk factor. And it's a high risk factor. And it's an important risk factor. All my friends went on a diet, and we all went on a diet in high school. I'm the only one who got anorexia nervosa because I'm the one who had that temperament. So it's a combination, and you have to look at both. 
So I'm just going to briefly show you this because I knew this was a different crowd, not people who normally, not everybody here was going to be um, treating eating disorders. And I just want you to say, if you're, if you're not convinced, there are several cultural studies that show. The, the most popular one is, the well-known one is the Fiji one. And how many people have heard that? Probably the regular uh, eating disorder treaters. In 1995, there was no television in Fiji. It's amazing to believe, right? It was a year before Montanito opened. No television. Television came to Fiji in 1995. By 1990, and they had no dieting and no eating disorders. In fact, you were considered beautiful um, and, and um, uh, attractive if you were big. And in three years after television came to Fiji, they had uh, the young girls reporting um, dieting and vomiting to lose weight. They, they reached the same level of percentage of girls reporting that as in the US within three years watching television. So if that's not something about how the culture uh, affects and is a risk factor for eating disorders, I don't know what is. And there's a bunch of these. High prevalence in urban areas, media, um, increase in incidence of eating disorders in the 20th century, immigration to Western society is an increase. But the one that I think is probably the biggest is, the, is, a re, is a fairly recent, because a lot of these are old, a 2012 study where body image emerged as the highest risk factor for developing an eating disorder. And, and this is when I came up with my comparison that people who get eating disorders are like our um, canaries. There are cultural canaries in the coal mine. So when the miners took canaries down um, into the coal mines, um, unfortunately, the can if the canaries died, it meant it was a toxic environment and everyone had to get out. So there is something about people who develop eating disorders that uh, something, and I think it's part temperament and it's also part um, environment and psychological factors, obviously. Um, it's said a lot, genes, genes load the gun and environment pulls the trigger. But so then we have to look at how do we make then more resistant, resilient canaries the temperament, the anxiety, how to rewire the brain, and um, how do we improve and deal with the environment, the cultural pressures, body image, and stuff like that. Cindy Bulick, one of the top genetic researchers, said, although there's nothing they can do to alter the passing down of DNA, they can alter environments that influence the likelihood of genes being expressed. So that's called double dosing. So children with parents who have an eating disorder they can get the genetics, but also, as you might have already thought when I was talking about genes earlier, um, they, they may, if they have an eating disorder and they have a kid with an eating disorder, they're not just passing down their genes, <laughs> they're passing down behaviors like dieting or compulsive exercises. They're passing down body dissatisfaction. And then three others that were studied in, in this particular study in 2009, um, they have problematic feeding behaviors, how they feed their kids. They have an overemphasis on weight and shape. And then there's this er interesting area of life events and distress tolerance. So that's where epi the word epigenetics. Epigenetics is where how do non-genetic factors cause genes to behave or express themselves in a certain way. So I want to just start into a little bit uh, um, then we'll take a break, but I want to do a few slides on um, environment gene interaction, especially related to anxiety. So this is really interesting. A high percentage of people with anorexia and bulimia also had before or will have a diagnosis of anxiety disorder. In fact, approximately 85% of those with anorexia get that diagnosis and one of their parents. That's high. I remember people used to say early on, I've had my license since 1979. Early on, people would say, oh, they're depressed, you know? And I would say, they're anxious. And this is knowing how to treat um, anxiety, and there's gonna be several slides on this next, is, is so useful in this and hopefully in other things that you might be dealing with as well. So relationships are critically important in this because attachment experience facilitate or mitigate gene um, expression. 
brain development, and even correcting behaviors based on is there trust or attachment or feeling safe. So I want to tell the story about me and my mom. Um, when I, uh, it first happened, uh, it happened twice, but it first happened in the first grade. Um, I loved school. I loved my teacher. I'd like to come home and talk to my mom and whatever. But at some point, <coughs> I started not wanting to go to school. And I was diagnosed with school phobia, or what later I found out was separation anxiety. I could sit in school if my mom came with me and sat in the classroom and I'd turn around. If she was there, I was fine. If she was there, I was fine. If I turned around and she was gone, I'd bolt out the door and try to run home. You can imagine, at some point, the school principal said, she cannot come back to school until you take her to therapy. And here's the interesting part. It was my mom's therapy that made the difference. I went. And that was, they didn't have family therapy really going on, and they sent me into one room, and my mom went and saw her psychologist in another room, and I can tell you all I remember is playing checkers and hitting a doll that every time I hit it popped back up. And that's all I remember. <laughs> I'm pretty young, but all of a sudden I'm going to school. I don't know why. And I remember telling my mom, you're wasting your money. Mom, you're wasting your money. Um, and we drive every day. and. Anyway, years later, <coughs> when I was studying psychology, and of course you study and you learn all these things, and I like, what was that? What happened to me? I wrote back to my psychologist and said, what, what was that? Can you tell me what happened in my treatment? Why did I get better? Why did I start going to school? And he said, you're going to have to ask your mom, because it was what happened with your mom. So I, my next trip home from, from university, I, I go to my mom, it's surprised she never told me, but um, when she was in her sessions, she uncovered a traumatic memory of finding her father. Her father shot himself. Her mother died in childbirth. Her father shot himself when she was about the age when this started happening to me. She was about six um, in first grade, we were about six. Um, she was the one who found him. She had not remembered that. It was a repressed memory. She had no idea it happened. But when I got of that age, she started to have these fears about something that's going to happen to me. She never told me that, but this is the radar with kids. I picked up on it that she didn't want to let me go. She didn't really understand it. She thought she wanted me to go to school. But when she, what I call, metabolized her own trauma, when she healed that, I started going to school. I think that's fascinating. I like to talk about it because it informed my treatment in the sense that all these things we do, um, well, so let me back up for a minute. So um, early life stress, severe trauma, even stress, and there have been several studies that show even stress our grandparents experienced can compromise our own ability to self-regulate. And there are some studies about <coughs> Holocaust grandparents and people who have eating disorders and probably other disorders as well. So it's so important to do a family history assessment and to find out when someone developed first kinds of symptoms, maybe anxiety disorder, separation anxiety, things like that, or eating disorder, what was going on in your parents' life, what was going on in their history. It's also important because sometimes treatments, like family-based treatment that's pretty highly promoted, is not likely to work in some situations where there are issues that are just do not render themselves to family-based treatment, and then getting help for specific members, um, family members, for example, who might have anxiety and where it's continuing to um, contribute to the disorder without people knowing. And, and to demonstrate that, I love this study done by this, um, this guy who studies rhesus <coughs> monkeys who took what we're going to call highly reactive monkeys, and these were monkeys that have a lot of anxiety. They were called high reactive monkeys. They're easily agitated when exposed to environmental stressors. Low reactivity monkeys, low anxiety, adapt well to stress. So they thought, what happens if we take high anxiety monkeys and raise them with high anxiety mothers or low anxiety mothers? When they raised uh, the high anxiety mothers, raised their own high anxiety babies, the babies became completely socially inept. 
so anxious, so agitated, they actually got ostracized from the monkey group. When they took um, the highly reactive monkeys and raised them with low reactive mothers, they not only reacted normally, but they became highly skillful and leaders because the way I like to see it is their traits, all that energy, got channeled into a, into a positive way. So when, when we talk about anxiety, our brain searches, our brain is trained, our prefrontal cortex and amygdala, and we're gonna talk about that more after the break, um, monitors the environment for signs of danger, which involves those two areas of the brain. So for example, if I raise my hand like this, am I waving to somebody, Christina out there in the audience? Or am I hailing a cab? Or if you're somebody who's had trauma, let's say domestic violence or whatever, and I go like that, you might think you're about to be hit. You're, that's your brain reacting to something, even though it might not make any sense um, at, at the moment. So we have these ways of being on alert mode, fright, fight, flight, and freeze. You may have only heard three of them uh, before, but a lot of times the fright one is left out. So these two parts of the brain, the prefrontal cortex, or um, one of my colleagues call, calls it the prefrontal croutons, so in case you can't remember that, because it's, it's hard to remember all these brain things. But I did, I have been told if you put slides of the brain in your talk, people think you're smart and give you better evaluations. <laughs> so I'm hopeful. Um, you know, I'm, 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 I'm harm avoidant, so. Um, the, it, the prefrontal cortex is the part of our brain, well, let me explain the amygdala first. The amygdala is sort of like the reptile brain. That's the part of the brain that's that you cannot have anxiety without the amygdala going off. The amygdala is what uh, processes our emotions and, and our anxiety. What the prefrontal cortex does is sometimes tells the amygdala to go off, like that is a snake, you need to react, right? Um, but it also contains the amygdala, like that's not a snake, you thought it was, but it's a stick. And so our prefrontal cortex is the part of us that regulates our emotions, reasoning, um, it, it contains our responses, and actually what happens is it releases GABA, which turns off the alarm system in the amygdala. This is w w in part where name it to tame it come from. So if you ever heard that before, when sometimes when clients say, how's talking about this gonna help? Just talking about an emotion and labeling it reduces the amygdala firing. I think that's so interesting because you start to have a context, you start to have a, a way to explain what's happening. So even somebody who can't explain their emotions, with people with eating disorders are very low on interoceptive awareness, meaning I don't know if this feeling in my stomach is hunger or jealousy, you know? They're very low on that, so helping them to be able to name things decreases this amygdala firing. And not only that, studies in UCLA, um, these are the preliminary studies, I don't know the follow-up, but showed that people with anore anorexia for sure have a hyper amygdala response, higher than normal people. Now I get it, I get it why I am um, uh, in a movie theater and I'm the person in the theater that annoys everybody because something scary ha comes up and I scream. You know, I, 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 I have a high alarm system that is, that is still with me. It's correlated with anxiety. And what's interesting is they thought it was gonna be like maybe people with body dysmorphic disorder, but it turns out they have a hypo amygdala response, which is interesting, but they have a hyper prefrontal cortex, which means that, and it's gonna make sense when I tell you, that someone with OCD goes immediately to a prefrontal cortex, solution-oriented thing, you know? turn off the flame, wash my hand. They go immediately not to the emotional part, but the fix it, how do you fix it part. I think that's fascinating. <laughs> so if people with anorexia process similar to those with anxiety disorder, that leads to this avoidance behavior and maladaptive coping. <coughs> so if you look at the cultural context, afraid not to get an A, it's not like I felt really good when I got an A, it was like relief that I didn't get a B. Do you know what I mean? It's a whole different thing, it's a whole different thing afraid of not being in control, very sensitive to, you can see as the rates of 
dieting articles in magazines went up, the rates of eating disorders went up. And you can see this happening in other countries. As the rates of obesity <coughs> went up here in America, in Australia, um, in, in, in other countries, you see as the rates of obesity, why does anorexia nervosa go up? Because there's an obesity scare. Because it's like, don't get fat, start counting your fat grams. Start, you can see how they are, are going along together. Fattening food for someone with anorexia, it's no longer, or even bulimia, it's no longer, there's certain um, fattening foods. It turns into food is fattening. It flips around to food is fattening. So with CBT, you're working with the prefrontal cortex and you do things to interrupt the, and change the thinking <coughs> process. It's not what happens, it's what the cortex makes of what happens, right? What does my cortex make of that? Oh, steak, scary, stick, not scary. So you have to rewire the cortex. And the more you get someone to think different things, the more the old ways of thinking decreases. So for example, a client with bulimia, if the, if the patient says, if I eat this ice cream, I'm going to get fat. Or I had to throw it up because I knew uh, it was gonna make me gain weight. It's not eating the ice cream, it's what their brain tells them about it. So what we try to do, and going back to the tape you saw, I would ask them, what would you say to your seven-year-old niece if she said that? What would you say to a person you're babysitting? This kid comes up and says, oh, I'm not gonna, you know, Carolyn, I'm not gonna eat this ice cream because I'm gonna get fat. What would you say to her? I've never had the patients say, oh, I would say to that seven-year-old, yeah, you better not eat that ice cream. You know, it's going to go right to your thighs. They don't. They know better. And they think about it for a minute. And what they'll start to do is say, well, but I don't believe it or I don't. But that's a whole different part of the conversation. First, I want them to be able to, to get it out there, what they would say to somebody else. And then, well, why are you different? So we start to deal with that part next. So I call it contacting and transforming the eating disorder self. You have them journal back to their eating disorder thoughts. You have them dialogue between their eating disorder self and their healthy self. I role play, uh, I'll, I'll be the eating disorder self, I'll be the healthy self, because sometimes they get stuck and can't do it. And then there are very specific assignments that we talk about in the, in the Eight Keys book and workbook where we say things like, write a goodbye letter to your eating disorder self. And they might be, Oh, I don't want to say goodbye, but I go write it and then write back from your eating disorder. Let's see what it has to say back. You get them. I always say, this illness is not between you and me. It's between you and you. You have to make friends with, that's not enemies with. If you have a person saying, I hate you eating disorder, get out of my life, you've ruined it. That doesn't work. So when I see them doing that, I say, what do you think would happen if all my clients came in to see me and I went, your eating disorder is disgusting. Get it out of your life. Get rid of it. You know, it, is, it just goes into hiding. They have to learn from it. That's why I call it contacting and transforming it. Okay, this is the break, the, the 10 minute break. I put that in there or else I would have just kept going. I'll see you back in 10 minutes. Just for a few moments, Cheryl Camby of the Meadows, who's our partner organization and putting these on. Cheryl. Thanks, Dr. Galbar. I'm gonna stand in the light over here because it's a little dark. Um, my name is Cheryl Cambay. Um, this is, we're ending our third year now, Dr. Galbart, of co-hosting this event with you guys. So um, closing out a really good year. And as you saw, we have another great lineup of speakers for 2019. So thank you again for being here. I work for the Meadows. The Meadows is a treatment center in Wickenburg, Arizona. We've been around for over 42 years five individual or specialized programs that are inpatient level of care and residential treatment centers. So we have a dual license, full-time nursing and psychiatry. Although we're not a locked facility, we're more insight oriented and treatment focused at the Meadows. Trauma treatment has been our specialty for over 40 years. PM Melody developed our model for treating trauma um, well over 35 years ago. And our five specialty programs includes the Meadows main campus where it's a co-ed facility treating trauma, addiction, um, dual diagnosis, primary mental health, and then our young adult program is called the Claudia Black Center. Um, Claudia does work at that program. It's for ages 18 to 26. Two gender-specific programs treating sex and love addiction. Um, Dr. Patrick Carnes founded the men's program called Gentle Path at the Meadows for men, and our women's program, Willow House at the Meadows. His daughter, Stephanie Carnes, who spoke this year here, 
um, runs that program at the Meadows. And then the eating disorder program that we have was called Remuda Ranch for many, many years, and we rebranded it this year to be called the Meadows Ranch. All women, eating disorders, and our only adolescent program in the system, adolescent girls, 12 beds, um, on the same campus, but it's, they're treated separately with separate staff. Um, that's also an inpatient level of care where we're able to do also weight restoration and stabilization with the hospital license, but in a ranch setting. So that's kind of the difference at the Meadows with the license in Arizona. Um, we're in network with TRICARE at all the Meadows programs. Our eating disorder program is in network with most major insurances. We also have an IOP in the Scottsdale area. And we're opening two intensive outpatient programs in the new year, one in Sunnyvale, California, Northern California, and the other one is in Dallas. So outside of our inpatient programs, we also have a retreat center called the Rio Retreat Center, 15 different five-day workshops and therapeutic retreats. Those are for clients that are not as acute as our inpatient clients, but still want a therapeutic experience. I have a lot of information in the back, and um, any questions that you have, please let me know. And if I don't have your information, please let me know. Just in the last 24 hours, I've made maybe four or five referrals to the South Bay area for therapists. Um, someone here I just gave a referral to. Our discharge planners always want to know who we could refer to in the community. So if I don't know you or have your information, please give that to me in the back. Thank you again for being here. Happy holidays. Enjoy the Thanksgiving this week. And we'll see you guys again in the new year. Thanks. Okay, I'm gonna actually say two things because uh, two people asked me questions at the break and so I thought I'm, I'm and I'm gonna try to uh, stop and have questions towards the end. If I start getting really close to the end and haven't stopped, somebody stop me. Um, I have so much to say. I love uh, uh, talking about this. Um, but someone asked me about the relationship with um, sexual abuse, trauma, and eating disorders. And, and when the, f the first researchers looked at it, they didn't find a correlation. Um, but the second time, uh, uh, w basically what they discovered is there's a, there, there is a high correlation in people who have purging as a part of their eating disorder. It's, it's not that it's not in restrictor anorexia nervosa, let's say. There is trauma in those in histories of some of our patients who have that. But what really came through in this um, long study, a quite extensive study, was that uh, sexual abuse and trauma are related to the eating disorders where the client also has, has purging as one of their features. It makes sense to me. I won't go into that now, but probably makes sense to you. Um, and then somebody else asked me about uh, attachment in eating disorders. I think you'll see a little bit of that when I talk about the therapeutic relationship in a few minutes. Um, uh, but also, there are quite a few studies on eating disorders and attachment. Um, and what came out a lot is, and this, this isn't going to surprise you, is the anxious attachment style and, um, and, and the correlation to that. And how, and what's really interesting about that is how you can change an anxious, anxious attachment style and help develop someone who becomes securely attached through the therapeutic relationship. So when I talk about therapeutic relationship um, in a little while, um, uh, you can sort of bring this, that statement back to mind. So anxiety, so I was talking about anxiety, raising your hand, whatever. Anxiety um, c can be caused by thoughts and, con and um, cognitions, like I was just talking about. You, you do CBT and you have people rethink different things and re-say different things and retrain their brain. But it can also um, bypass the prefrontal cortex and go right to the amygdala. The amygdala is always involved, like I said, but it's very interesting that sometimes, and this is a woman, this is a book called Rewire Your Anxious Brain by um, Catherine Pittman. And anxiety, what's interesting in these two pathways, she talked about her daughter going down into their cellar and seeing this dark um, jacket and instantly freaking out and getting upset and, and, and crying because information goes into the thalamus and then it goes either 
to the prefrontal cortex, to the amygdala saying, you know, that's a scary man, be afraid. Or sometimes it just reminds you of something you've seen before, like kind of like I was saying, the snake and the stick, and it goes directly to the amygdala and it shuts off. Your thinking brain is not thinking. Have you ever been there? Your thinking brain is not thinking. So basically, I call this the edge of a cliff instinct. And when I'm talking to people with eating disorders, I talk to them about how they, the behavior is automatic. Uh, um, for example, the person is, you're working with someone and you talk about what they're gonna have for lunch and they, they yeah, 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 and they go up and they sit down at the table and they get afraid. Instant fear, just as though, like this person on this cliff. It's hardwired in, this, this woman on the cliff, it's hardwired in her brain to be afraid. It gets hardwired in people with eating disorders in their brain to be afraid. Talking and doing, you know, talking back to the eating disorder self is not gonna be enough in certain cases. The same thing is how uh, hardwired behaviors, the more you do a behavior, the more it creates these neural pathways that become automatic. Uh, one of the examples is that I use with the clients is think about uh, a Vietnam vet who hears a heli helicopter going, I have one who, who is a construction worker that works for my husband and I, um, he hearing a helicopter go over um, wants to dive under a table. It is not rational. His prefrontal cortex will say, you know, I'm in Malibu and it's 2018, but it doesn't matter. The amygdala is off and running. So your brain learns from from weakening old circuits and strengthening new ones. And there are so many ways to do it. I uh, had a snake phobia and got treated with EMDR. How many people know what EMDR is? Um, oh good, I don't have to explain it. And I still do not like snakes and uh, yeah. Uh, and, but I don't throw a book. I used to be so bad if I looked at a book, I would, um, uh, I, I had to throw it down or a movie. Sometimes I had to walk out a movie if it had snakes in it. There are ways to sort of retrain our circuits, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about that. So the one thing that, that therapists are trained to do when they treat eating disorders is, you know, look for triggers. Like, what triggered, so the client says, I binged and purged, and what triggered, you know, I got upset with my mom, and then those are the things that we're taught to do in therapy. There's a trigger, even in DBT, you know, there's this, react this the the behavior chain analysis but the thing that we're not trained so much to do is what about the behaviors that become homeostatic because if you treat someone who's had bulimia nervosa for a long time they don't get triggered to binge and purge they wake up and are planning their binge how they're going to do their binge that day or how they're going to do it that night or on the way home from work that's what they do sort of like someone who has like an alcoholic who, you don't say, what triggered you to drink today? I mean, sometimes it's true, but they're at this point drinking. Just like someone with an eating disorder is doing their behaviors over a period of time because if you repeatedly eat ice cream and throw up, your brain becomes ice cream purge. Make, it makes sense, right? So I talked to the clients about this idea of, of neural pathways and how, for example, um, if you go to an area where there's snow and you take a sled down the snow, you create a groove in the snow. So you go back up with the inner tube, it's much easier to go down the groove that's already made, much harder to create a new groove, but you can. You just have to work at creating the new groove. So when people say, I don't know how it's gonna be any different, I don't see how I'm gonna stop, it's automatic, my behavior's automatic. I say, it's like riding a bike. When you first got on a bike, it wasn't automatic, but once you do it for a while, you can get to the point where you do it hands-free, right? It's, you, we're going to retrain your brain. This is hopeful to them, I think. And so there's a lot of ways to do it. Um, reconsolidation or rewiring, where you bring up the, the event, the issue or whatever, and you pair it with a positive experience. And there's a lot of work from a guy called Jeff Schwartz at UCLA with OCD. Um, and some of this is taken from that. Um, but with clients with eating, and, and he does it with OCD, but with clients with eating disorders, think of it as, as doing two important things. Relabeling, so this is not a fattening food. In fact, what I always say is there's no such thing as a fattening food. I'll say, here's 
brownies and here's an apple, which one of these is fattening? You know what they're going to say. But then I say, there's no such thing as a fattening food. I ate a brownie last night. I am not fat today. It doesn't, it, uh, there's fattening eating habits. If I ate brownies every day, all day long, and that's all I ate, right? So you have to, so you rewire it by relabeling and then refocusing, which means get them to eat a brownie doing a pleasurable experience at the same time, which is why we would have music um, at Montanito, why we would have, um, why would I, I would um, eat with clients myself and, and play, play a game at the same time, or we would have angel cards or blessings at the table, or we would um, uh, tell jokes. Especially this works if you do it with um, somebody who they feel attached to, somebody that they feel uh, you know, safe with and trust, which is why the therapeutic relationship becomes so important. So the other thing is uh, when you're growing these new brain circuits and, and you do it, if you, if you wire it, and you've heard of dopamine, I'm sure. There's a lot of people who treat addictions here. Dopamine, you know, the, the sort of the pleasure reward factor, it, 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 um, dopamine is released when you pair this behavior to a pleasurable activity, and then that helps to grow these new, these new circuits. So the new circuits then compete with the old ones, which of course is um, use it or lose it. And then there's exposure response prevention, which is also used for a lot for OCD, which is definitely useful in eating disorders as well. And it's staying in the presence of the situation or object um, that promotes the anxiety without acting uh, through the be behavior that the client usually does. There's a lot of stuff on this. I'm going to talk about it briefly. So let's say you have a client with bulimia. You, you, they binge and you, per, you, you put them in an exposure situation where you prevent them from purging, let's say. That's one. There's plenty you can do. Um, you can just imagine all the different things you do. And there's a lot of things that are important about exposure, like certain medications will prevent it. Um, some people try to do exposure and they're very reassuring to the client, you know, and, and you can't do that because then the person can do it only when you're there reassuring them. Um, because the brain is really smart that way. You have to get them to be able to do it and know they can do it on their own. You can start with the pairing, what I said earlier, pairing it with someone pleasurable, someone reassuring, someone, but this is a different thing. If that doesn't work, you might have to do exposure where they're in the situation and they they tolerate the ability to do the, the thing, either eat without purging or eat a piece of pizza or whatever it is. Or um, extinction, where you repeatedly expose the person to doing the same thing. So when we took clients to restaurants all the time, they ate and then we spent time with them afterwards. Or when they eat in the, in the treatment center. Or I would have sessions in private practice where they would bring food, eat with me. They'd have to have another, uh, another hour session after that to prevent um, them being able to get rid of the food. And then this other one, visualization, which is um, really one of my favorite things to talk about um, because visualization is a form of practice. I don't know how much you, you've heard this, but the way our brain works, if you, if you think about, if I think about drinking this tea, no, if I drink the tea, let me do that first because I want to. And if I visualize drinking the tea, the same part of my brain lights up. That's fascinating. Okay, so musicians and athletes have known this for a long time. Just gonna give you a couple examples. Um, the, these two group of students who never played the piano before were taught how to play the piano. The first group got to practice physically and the second group had to practice only imagining which is really like hard to believe, but they were not allowed to actually, once they learned the song, they had to practice without touching the keys. In three days, the mental players were as accurate as the physical players, astonishing. In five days, the physical practice group was a little bit better, but it only took a two hour session for the mental practice group to catch up. The Russians were the first to start reporting this about, about um, Athletics, they, they use it in the Olympics. They train their athletes. They all do. And you'll know. You'll see athletes talking about they'll go up to the ski slope, for example, and then they'll imagine skiing down the same slope. They'll imagine where the turns are going to be. Mm -hmm. And it turns out 
the Russians took three groups, 100% did physical, I mean, uh, the first group, 100% did physical training, and the second group, 75 physical training, 25% mental training, and in the third group, it was 50-50. Um, so it turns out the best results, even better than full physical uh, training, was a combination of mental training and physical training. So when I talk to the clients about that, you know, it's, it's funny because when, they, when I want to do visualization, I have to remind them that they have to do the real thing part of the time <laughs> and the visu visualizing it part of the time. And the idea, then the application to eating disorders is if you have a client who has a hard time eating a cookie or eating pasta or eating out at the dinner table with their family or not purging after eating, doing a visualization with them and they go through the entire experience. And there's a lot of ways that I teach therapists to do it. You have to help the person not be anxious. And if they're closing their eyes, I, I let them come back. I have them raise their finger if they're getting too anxious so they can come back out out of it and then take a few deep breaths and then go back into the visualization. So you might even not get through a whole restaurant scene. You might only get in the door ordering on the first time you do it. But it's amazing when you realize and they realize they don't have to go do the thing to begin to get better at doing the thing. I mean, they eventually have to, like I say, the 50-50 thing. And then this one where, okay, so imagine a day in my life when I'm fully recovered. And um, that's just getting them to start to see. I can't do this too early with a client because they're unable to do it. But beginning them to sort of project forward to what their life might look like. So um, training your prefrontal cortex to calm your amygdala, otherwise known as meditation. <laughs> but it sounds so much more scientific the first way. All these things listed up there, all these things are controlled by the prefrontal cortex. Body regulation, attuned communication, emotional balance, response flexibility, which I call respond versus react, um, being alert but calm, empathy, insight, all these things are controlled by what I talked about earlier, this part of the brain that controls the amygdala. And it turns out that part of the brain gets thicker, stronger, the fibers and the gray matter get bigger um, with meditation. So you can imagine uh, meditating monks have a very thick, stronger uh, part of their prefrontal cortex. By the way, I will make the slides available. I wasn't able to do it because of the fires. I could, didn't have any power or email, so I couldn't get them to Jamie, but I will get them to Jamie afterwards. So mindfulness develops this capacity for an alert, calm presence, shifts the brain to an approach state rather than withdrawal. So if you're harm avoidant and you, part of your brain, gets work through mindfulness training to shift to more of an approach state rather than withdrawal, that will help you in terms of dealing with scary food, for example, if you have anorexia, or helping people with um, bulimia or binge eating disorder deal with a binge challenge. And there's a lot of stuff that talks about mindfulness and all this, and I would suggest there's a lot of good books, but Dan Siegel's newest book called Awareness. So practices that facilitate mindfulness um, other than meditation, um, and you can imagine with my temperament, I'm not, I'm not the best at meditating, um, but there are other things that um, our mindfulness practice so you don't have to meditate <coughs> to do it. One of the things I just call going inside, you know, it's kind of what meditation is anyway, but having, just have a client, especially a very anxious client, come in and sit down and take a minute, closing their eyes, going internally for a minute before you start the session and teaching them to be able to do that. I did that for a few minutes in the chair up here before we started today. I, even on the way here, I've been speaking for I don't even know how many years. I still say to my friend Glenn, oh, I'm anxious, you know. Um, focusing on the breath. Breath work is a very anti-anxiety thing. In fact, there's a specific kind of breathing that is anti-anxiety breath. Um, walking in nature. I heard a quote once that nature brings meditation to you. You don't have to work hard. 
Um, and there's a lot of fascinating new studies about yoga. I did a book a, a, a couple years ago uh, called Yoga and Eating Disorders, and I, I didn't write the whole book. I wrote, um, I organized the, the authors. I wrote a couple chapters for it. But it is amazing the research that's happening on, and when you think about it, it's a, I don't know how many thousand year old practice of of integrating mind, body, and spirit. And what's so mixed up in people with eating disorders is disconnect from mind, body, and, and spirit. But also, um, there's a guy who was um, did a chapter in this book who has a new program for trauma. And it is unbelievable what's happening with, with yoga and trauma. And because it's all the somatic stuff, it's being able to, not the talk therapy, because it bypasses talk. It goes right to the amygdala, but it changes physically the way your body holds it. So I think that's uh, worth, worth looking at. So several years ago, Time Magazine came out with an article on meditation. And one of the things that I learned shortly after that was that um, patients treated by meditating therapists improve significantly more than patients treated by non-meditating therapists. In this very interesting study, um, Great Mayor uh, and colleagues in Germany. Well, well, first I got a little anxious about it. I mean, of course I did, because I thought, I'm not that good at meditating, you know? And if, if the patients are better if I meditate. So luckily there's all those other ways that I talked about. But what's so interesting about this is why would that be so? Why would that be true, that, that, that if you uh, meditate as a therapist, you ha have your own? Anyway, anybody have More anything presence. you want to sh shout out? More present. Like when you're More present. It does have to do with presence, for sure. Yeah. Less reactivity in your own self. You know, what did somebody else say? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not a big leap, sort of, to figure it out, right? Especially with patients who can make us very anxious, especially if, in eating disorders, I find a lot of, there's a lot of, um, because it can be so dangerous, you know, it's probably an addiction too, but because it can be so, you know, I've seen people in the tape that you saw, I mean, a lot of people were very anxious around that girl. There's more things I could say about it, but anyway, sometimes it's easy to get anxious around someone you think's gonna d drop dead of a heart attack, you know? Anyway, our presence. Not just the interventions we offer or the theoretical stance we take is the most robust predictor of how patients respond. I don't know if you know that, but when you look at all the evidence-based treatments, when people are saying CBT and FBT and IPT and DBT and EFT and all that, I have a funny slide that then has the Dalai Lama and says, or a cup of tea. <laughs> um, because sometimes, and, and by the way, most people, how many people have heard that, that the therapeutic relationship is the most um, robust predictor. How many people have heard that? I think a lot of people have heard it. Keep your hand up, keep your hand up. Keep it up if you know where to cite the research for that. Okay, well, good. Because let me tell you, the CBT and FBT and DBT and IPT, people have their research and they know where to cite it. So it's important, I think, if we believe that, if we believe that the therapeutic relationship is the most powerful determinant, or even one of them, then it's really good to know where it comes from and to have stuff to back it up. So, so I'm gonna give you a little. Um, so an overactive neurobiological defense system that we talked about earlier makes it hard for many clients to engage effectively, especially people who've had trauma and people who have had eating disorders are often very hard to engage because of this am amygdala response thing, for one. And because of the connection that a lot of people with eating disorders had trauma so therapists can help downregulate these involuntary defense mechanisms that come up that by regulating the client's nervous system, creating new pathways, enhancing the client's ability to feel safe, which allows for this deeper work. And a, a lot of this is talked about in this guy's work, um, Porges. I don't know if you know uh, him, and this and all the stuff about the polyvagal nerve. And I did a chapter in a book that just came out in August, and the book is Trauma-Informed Approaches to Eating Disorders. And I, they asked me to do a chapter, and I said, I will if I can do it on the therapeutic relationship. And my whole thing in this, cha in this book, in this chapter, is about ways of being as a therapist or therapeutic presence that 
enhance the therapeutic relationship and contribute to success. And it has to do with eye contact. It has to do with when not to give eye contact. You, if you remember the, the videotape, when the client goes like this, arches back and kind of looks away, that's a classic thing that happens in attachment when the attachment is being disrupted and, and babies go like this and arch back and look away and then I get calmer, I get smaller, I put my head down. I don't know what I'm doing, but sometimes it's a instinctive for us, you know? Um, and, and acceptance and non-judgments and these kinds of things. And that's what m mindfulness practices do that you naturally sort of knew. They um, help us with attention, empathy, acceptance, and non-judgment. And if you want to see how good you are at it, there is a therapeutic presence inventory. Um, and you'll get it in the slides because you'll get the, this uh, quote that comes out of this, um, uh, I think the name of the book is A Mindful Approach to, oh no, those are two different citations. So you have to just look up this therape therapeutic presence inventory where you can sort of take a little quiz and see how you're doing with your therapeutic presence. So I don't want you to hear that, but I want you to see two years later this client that you saw earlier on the tape. This is her. She came back to see me, and that's her watching her, which was fascinating. So she's watching herself on the tape that you all saw. She's weight restored here. What's interesting, and I'm not going to play it. I don't even have the time to, is that what she said, so this presence thing is about attunement, is about feeling felt by the other person, a sense of security. And what she says, she says a lot of things. Oh, let me just stop that movement. Um, what she says is, um, one of the things she says is, I don't remember anything that we were talking about, but I remember how I felt. I felt like you were listening. I felt safe. I felt like you were working and meeting me halfway, things like that. It's kind of a fascinating thing to watch. Um, but we're not doing that today. So I want to talk about body image. Um, and you're going to see another client uh, who says, uh, one of the things that she talks about in here is how I don't see other people as fat, but I do see myself that way. Have you heard that from clients before? It's very interesting. And so people often think, well, how can that be? How can you look at someone and don't see them? And look at, how does that happen? And, um, uh, so is she lying to justify? A lot of, a lot of people thought, well, they're just lying because they have to justify the restriction. Um, is it a problem with their brain? If it's a true perception problem, what came first? You know, Did her perception get distorted by the eating disorder, or was it off to begin with? And, and even if we know these things, what do we tell her, and, and how do we help her? So there's this research with um, fMRI imaging well, they took patients with anorexia and they took uh, control subjects and they had them look at pictures first of, of other people and their brains lit up exactly the same way. Then they had the people with anorexia in the control group look at pictures of themselves and everything changed. The people with anorexia, their brain works differently. It's the area of the brain called the insula, but it, it completely works differently than normal control. Same when you're looking at other people, different when they're looking at themselves. So this is pretty fascinating. We don't actually know why, and we don't know if it's before or after. We can't know much about before and after because we don't know who to study who might get an eating disorder. So there's not a bunch about that. But it's interesting in the sense of what you can talk to people about it, or what you can say to people, and how you deal with them knowing that they're about their um, perception. So I call it thin blindness, and uh, I just want to point out to you, if you look over there, uh, is anybody here who's colorblind? Well, you don't have to admit it if you don't want to, but I don't know what colors you are, but can everybody see the 29? But if you're colorblind in that spectrum, you're not going to see it. And people can tell you it's there, they can tell you it's there all they want, I can say you're not fat, you're not fat, you're not fat, but if you see it, you're going to believe what I tell you, you're going to believe what you see. And it's the same thing if you're, uh, if you're really phobic about the thing, it's even worse. My snake phobia, which is much better, I told you, but if there was a snake there on the floor and I saw it, you could all tell me there's no snake there, but if I saw it, I'm going to get out of this room. 
right? No, I'd be very calm, cool, and, you know, tell somebody else to get rid of it. Um, but it's sort of thin blindness, you know, and it's good to know about that in terms of the way that, that we talk to people. So you're going to see this client um, talking about it a little bit. Um, she, she, how this section opens is she's talking about, we're talking about weight gain and um, how is she going to welcome it and what could we do? And she says, I don't know, give me a brain transplant. So you're going to hear that and then you're going to hear what I, what I do next. Whoops, I guess you're not going to hear. Hold on. Oh, I turned off the sound, I think. I did. Okay, let me back up one. I hope this works. But somehow, how are you going to welcome it? How are you going to feel like, yes, I need to do this. Good. Okay. Yeah. And wait. No, no. It's like <laughs> you do that, it would make eating easier. Then you can I know. Like when I eat, I get so scared. Can you hear? Weight. Yeah. Isn't that weird? You have to gain weight. Wait, I have to stop it because I can't tell if you can hear or not hear. No, can't hear. Can't hear. So, let me see. Can can the audio guy back there turn it up? Me? I already did. I don't know what you're saying. Sign language. <laughs> Let's see. And you have to eat in order to gain weight, and yet okay. you're still trying not to. Yeah. We do. Can your brain transplant? <laughs> that would be nice. If I could just transplant that little, a little microchip that involves, uh, what, what should we call it? That involves distorted preoccupation with weight to the degree of insanity. Oh. <laughs> I like know? to make them laugh. Well, you're right. I mean, if you could do that, everything would be easier. But I'm talking about how can we help you do that? It's not impossible to make it be easier. It can be hard, but so it's not impossible to make it be easier. You live every day with the mindset that it's bad and you want to prevent it. Yeah. So you tell me why you want to gain weight. Maybe we need to reinforce it instead of me telling you why you should or why you need to. It'd be more comfortable for sitting. It'd be more comfortable yeah, for sitting. Yeah, bones won't be so hard on the chair. It'd be more comfortable. And for lying down. And I do, it's weird because I look at people who are healthy and I think, oh, I wish I could have a normal body like that. But then I feel fat. Like, it doesn't really make sense. You feel fat if you oh, look like, like that or you feel fat anyway? Anyway, and if I look like that, I think I feel terrible. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, like, I do like healthy, how healthy bodies look on other people. Mm -hmm. If you got that way, you'd feel terrible only because you're going to believe that distorted, wacko brain insanity chip that somehow you got, you know? So if you could just remember that I can't believe that, just as if you were given a little microchip implanted by aliens that made you see this as red, okay? And everybody else tells you it's green. When I tell you it's green and you see people coming in here and all the parents on Parents Weekend, they go, oh, that's green. And everybody else comes in and goes, that's green. And you know you see it as red. And then there's a few other people like Elizabeth goes, oh, no, that's red, like you. But you look around at all of us, and you start to decide who you trust, and you start to tell yourself, it doesn't matter if my body, like colorblind people have to do this, it doesn't matter if my brain sees that as red, I know it's green, I trust Carolyn and Mira and Jeff and, and Melissa and Kelly and the dead, the bad, the bad. You know, honestly, I think that's one of the, important ways that people get better is that in some ways you have to trust because you're not going to see it. I hated every pound. I cried. 
I didn't want to go out because I thought I was too fat. When other people were going, green, 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 green. Then, 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 you know? If you can look at me and look at Melissa and look at other people. I don't But if you could look at other people and say, oh yeah, I think they look good, you know? Then you have to realize so many sh short circuits when you get yourself. Um, oh shoot. I stopped it and I wanted, and I realized I wanted you to see a part. I'm going to go back for a minute, but I just wanted to point out it's weird. I, something short circuits when you look at yourself. And, and this is before I even heard about that fMRI study. You know, I was so fortunate when I read that, and then I happened to have gotten this on tape where I'm using a green, green, green. I have this green post it note, you know. Uh, let me go back to that because I just wanted to see something. We, she shifts to a different topic that I'm going to get to. So let me see if I can get there, right at the end. Right here. Postcard. Circuit. What? When I was a kid, I brought home a postcard of the Sahara Desert, and my friend had told me it was Niagara Falls. So I told him that I found it was Niagara Falls. And they kept saying that, you know, it's the Sahara Desert, and I wouldn't believe them. I insisted it was Niagara Falls. So, what? Because I, I don't know, that's just what I Well, believe. because you believed your, what your first friend said. Yeah. And so you hung on to that. Once you, does this mean that once you get decide something, it's very difficult for you to change your mind? Probably. Uh, I would think so. <laughs> You'd be very stubborn. Yes. <laughs> okay. Well... Somehow you got to stubbornly decide that you know you have anorexia nervosa, right? Okay, I can stop it. I don't. I can't tell if you heard that or not. Did you hear that? She, her friend sh shows her a postcard of the Sahara Desert and tells her it's Niagara Falls, mm -hmm. and so she goes around insisting it. So we're going to get to that in a little bit. Um, so it's it's important to understand how our patients' perceptions can be different because I think we didn't really get that before, and. Um, and about the trust issue, because like I said, that trust issue is important. If you all told me um, there's, a, there's not a snake, like I, the example I gave earlier, but, but I know Gwen and Christina and Emily, and if they said, if they came up, I trust them, I know them, I have a history with them, if they said, no, there really isn't, I'd be more likely to believe them than you, who, who I don't know. Um, so. I say to people, you know, at first you're not going to believe me, you're going to believe your eyes, but you do see yourself differently than you see other people, and I explain about the studies. Now, now I can say that. I mean, before in this tape, I didn't explain the studies because I didn't know about them, but now I talk to them about how their brains actually different and processes things differently. So um, this picture of the Sahara Desert, you know, brings up this idea of set shifting, and here's some more research and how the research can inform us about these traits called set shifting and central coherence that are in both people with anorexia and bulimia. Anybody heard of this? You know what set shifting is? Um, so it's when you get stuck on something and can't get off it. And I'm going to, and, and the, these things I'm about to talk about are traits. It's not a state that's created by the illness because it's, it, it's there in relatives of the illness. It turns out it was there before the illness because it's reported that it was there. And even when people recover, they still have this. So here's what it is. So let's say you take a bunch of, of people and you, uh, with, with eating disorders, particularly, oh, I shouldn't get away from this, particularly with anorexia, and you put them through this maze. You'd have normal controls, you put them through the maze, and I know it's true of bulimia also, but it's, it seems to be most of these traits that they study seem to be stronger in, in anorexia because more people with anorexia are more similar in terms of their traits than people with bulimia are, but still. So they will get through the maze pretty fast. They're adaptable, they're pretty intelligent. They get through the maze sometimes before the controls do, but then you change the maze. People with anorexia are like, 
I know the way. And it's the way that I went yesterday, and that's the way, and we're all going that way. They don't shift easily. They don't shift off something. Once they have a way, and so when I read these studies, I say to my husband, that's why I, when I, and I'm going to my friend Gwen's house, I have the way that I go. If there's a detour, I'm so screwed. You know, good thing for Google Maps. Yesterday, I, it took me through all these, you know, back ways. And I called my husband at one point and said, I'm so lost. The only thing I can do is go back to some place. If I find some place on the maze that I know, then I can, can get there. Very, very. So it's interesting about how these traits that still, still exist. Um, so it's hard to make these mental shifts. They become very rule-bound. Um, you saw the, the picture of the way I wrote in my journal, and I don't, I don't know what you thought about that, but you know that picture of me in the journal and the tiny little writing? It was like that every single page. It had to be in black ink. It's almost become superstitious if I write in blue ink, something bad's going to happen. And in eating disorder, what happens is, for example, if I take the cheese off my sandwich today and I take the cheese off my sandwich tomorrow, I take cheese off my sandwiches. Right? It, it becomes that um, tied in to behavior. Or I don't eat fat. Or I must weigh daily. The other one, weak central coherence, is getting caught up in the details. People who can't see the forest for the trees. So focusing very much on calories and fat grams and I'm going to be healthy and, and losing the whole picture of you're not healthy. You may not have very many fat grams, but you know now you're mu you have muscle wasting and everything else. Um, or this hyper focus on parts of the body, like I don't see my whole body, I see my thighs. I mean, for me, it was my stomach, my stomach, my stomach. Even that, I don't know, probably 79 pounds, which is the last I remember uh, getting to, um, my stomach, my stomach. So um, one of my friends and, and, and therapists who used to work for me always used to say to the clients, and so now it's this big thing that we say everywhere, um, bigger genes means bigger life. And they don't necessarily see that in the beginning. So how do you change that? Um, I already talked about how it's um, a trait, not a state. Cognitive remediation therapy is one way. So for example, that if you look at that black and white picture, what do you see first? Do you see a musician or do you see a girl's face? So can you switch? Now try to switch, OK? So this is what's difficult for them to do. If they see one, it's harder for them to switch it. This is a fairly easy one. You start doing it. You show them pictures of this. I have a great one of a pair. Is this a parrot or a girl who's been painted? You do it, and you help um, clients learn to switch. We do um, maps. I'm terrible, terrible, terrible with maps. I get lost in the map. There's so many streets, and there's so much going on. And um, so uh, having clients um, Sometimes uh, I would say to the dietitian on meal addings, give someone the map and let them find the way to the restaurant you're going to. We play games like Pictionary with them where they have to think about, like they can't, you're going to lose Pictionary if you're drawing an eyeball on the human. You want to get someone to guess the word human, right? If you're drawing the eyes and nose and teeth, you're going to lose the game. So you know what I'm talking about, don't you? <laughs> yeah? Okay. So there are ways that you help them focus on both global and details and switching back and forth. Another one is to have someone describe an object and the other person draw it. Okay, I'm looking at, the, first you do a round circle up in the right side of the page. Then you go to the middle and you draw an arrow down and then you compare afterwards and show the client what they drew versus what was described to them so they get better and better at paying attention and breaking things down from a bigger picture into smaller parts. And so, someone also asked me at the break about, about my book and that's what we do in the book. This book, Eight Keys to Recovery from an Eating Disorder, there's a book and there's a workbook that Gwen and I, Gwen over there, wrote with me. Um, uh, it, it's important. We actually really break it down into steps. When I was first asked to write this book, I said, no, you know, a, a self-help book for eating disorders, you know, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think that'll work. Um, and when, when Gwen agreed to do it with me, then I thought, okay, I'm, I, I can do this. And it's in a series of other books on, you know, eight keys to, like I said earlier, eight keys to back pain and all that. 
Um, but what I think is important, and especially considering I almost didn't write this book, the reason I think this book, it's, it's the most popular book that I've written, and, um, the th and I hear from people and parents all the time about it, is it really breaks it down into steps. Because I really had to think, when they said eight keys, I went eight. There's probably 285,000 keys to curing someone with an eating disorder. So I had to think, what are these eight global, global things? And of course, one of them, I told you, eating disorder, self, healthy self. One of them is you have to reach out for people rather than your symptoms in order to get better. One of them is the behavior change stuff, separating from your thoughts and feelings. So anyway, um, breaking it down into steps and giving them assignments to do, I think helps for people who get lost and distracted with all the stuff that you have to do in order to get better. So um, this uh, idea about, about recovered versus recovering, we talk in the book, you know, um, a lot about being recovered and we have examples of people who are recovered and we talk about the difference in what we think about um, saying, even saying, I'm recovering or I'm in recovery from an eating disorder that you'll always have it. And what our patients believe matters and what we believe about them and their illness matters. And there isn't any evidence. You can come up to me afterwards if you want to, if you have some, email me. There isn't any evidence that eating disorders are addictions. There's a lot of addictive components to it, obviously, but addictions in the true sense of the word. And I have always thought, just like I did with the genetics and everything, that you can be over it, that you can be recovered. I'm not dealing with it one day at a time. If I, if I skip breakfast this morning, I'm not gonna be triggered into a, like if someone with alcohol drinks, I'm not gonna be triggered um, into a relapse. It's, it's a different kind of animal in a way. It's good to know the, the kind of properties that happen, like purging becomes sort of a, a habitual addictive behavior, but that's different than saying the whole illness is an addiction. So, and I think this is important because of what I'm gonna talk about in terms of the placebo effect, how um, the, the power of belief, and if people who come to me and say, oh, I was told I'll never, never be fully recovered, I will always be in recovery. I will always be recovering. And so um, just to say a little bit about placebo, there's placebo, which is this positive, uh, uh, how do medications and such have this positive effect, and um, nocebo, which is a negative effect. And there's a very, I, I don't know where the study is. I heard it a long time ago about patients who were um, allergic to poison oak, and the researchers put leaves on their arm and told them it was poison oak, but it wasn't poison oak, and, and a high percent, like 80% or so, broke out with poison oak. That was a, 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 a very dramatic study. Um, but also in patients who are, you know, you have six months to live, and then the patient dies, and then, and then it turns out his cancer was gone. There's all, if you start looking in placebo, you're gonna find some very fascinating things. So I have a few that I just wanna, wanna show you about. Uh, there was a new article just in November 2nd in the New York Times called What if the Placebo Effect Isn't a Trick? And it talks about how they're identifying certain enzymes and genomes to show this biochemical basis. It's quite complicated, so I'm not gonna talk about it much. But there's all these studies. For example, this woman, Jane Schoenfeld, who was an interior designer in California, who was in an effects or study, she had a 30 year depression. Um, th after the study, her depression was completely gone. Brain scans even showed the activity of her prefrontal cortex was changed like sort of that happens in antidepressant meds and she was on the placebo. She herself even freaked out and said there's no way, that's not possible, 30 years depression. Um, there's this research about fake knee surgeries. I don't even know how they did these studies, but where they took three groups and they, they actually opened up and, and made a, a surgical thing so the person thought they had knee surgery and there's this guy who couldn't even walk beforehand and afterwards playing with his grandkids and then they told him, you, we didn't really do anything to your knee. And that's weird, isn't it? It's really weird. Okay, but well, I'm fascinated by it because I think we, we know this. Everybody's heard of, who hasn't heard of placebo? 
but we, I don't think we use it enough in terms of the power of our mind and thinking and what we say to clients. And this last one, this one down here, and there's a book called The Emperor's New Drugs where, where they actually show in this meta study that, uh, and this was uh, reported in, in the Journal of American Medical Association, that placebos accounted for 75 to 80 percent of antidepressant medication effects. That's astonishing. Okay, that's all I'm going to say. Check it out. Decide for yourself. Um, but in this one where patients were receiving shocks, this one that I just put up, they, they were given electric shocks and they told certain patients that they were going to get this cream that relieved the pain and they, so they weren't going to get shocked as much. And you can see, and what happened is the activity decreased in the pain receptor areas, people getting placebos. It's wild, just wild. Okay, enough about that. The reason I say that is because I think what we say to them and exposing them to people who are recovered, going all the way back to my first research I ever did as a clinician 15 years in when I sent out my little survey, and they said talking to someone who recovered is important. I don't think you have to be a recovered therapist or, or um, dietitian or doctor, but I think they need exposure to people who are recovered. Because still to this day, I meet people who say, I never met anybody who was recovered. And I think, imagine if you had cancer and you never met anybody, never heard of anybody, never read a book about somebody who recovered from it. That's awful. And nobody was talking to you about that you could be recovered. So I think it's really uh, um, important. And it's what I'm doing now in my work is training coaches um, and a lot of uh, uh, recovered coaches to be able to, to give back. So here, some of the ingredients, um, uh, getting it from the inside out, specific tips they use to get better, um, appropriate challenges. My favorite one is when they say the no BS factor. Because when I first started talking about that, a lot of people said, oh, if you had an eating disorder, you're going to let your clients get away with things. That's not, that's not the case at all. I think I'm more able to challenge. And I think whether it's a mentor, whether they read a book, whether they just getting it from somewhere. So they get challenges. They, the, the, person can't, the client can't say, you don't get it, right? And then, of course, being role models and hope. One of the things they say all the time is hope and inspiration that I can do it too and that being recovered is possible. So I just want to give this definition and um, well, let me, oh yeah, and then I'm going to take questions. So what, what does that mean, recovered? Um, recovered is when you can accept your natural body size and shape. And I, and I have this, um, and I let them read it, and it's in the books now, so I go, where are we going, you know? Where are we headed? This is where we're headed together. You can accept your natural body size and shape and will no longer have a self-destructive or unnatural relationship with food or exercise. <coughs> When recovered, food and weight take a proper perspective in your life, and what you weigh is not more important than who you are. In fact, numbers are of little importance at all. When recovered, you will not compromise your health or betray your soul to look a certain way, wear a certain size, or reach a certain number on the scale. When recovered, you will not use eating disorder behaviors to deal with, distract from, or cope with other problems. And then I'll end with this um, Buddhist proverb, um, if we're facing in the right direction, in other words, I feel like if I get the patients on the, in the right direction, all they have to do is keep on walking. Okay, I have a, a little bit of time for questions, 10 minutes. I hope you have some because I stopped my slideshow here. <laughs> I mean, I could always talk, but let's just see if anybody has any questions. Yes, you can speak into the microphone and I'll try to repeat the question. Hi. Um, I was really interested with what you said before the break about the separation anxiety and way in your own life yeah. and the way that the treatment came about. What if, because um, I have two clients like this, what if um, the mother, let's say, or the father is, had died a long time ago and so there's no other person to to, for the client to talk to. Um, do you think doing a role play, or how would you handle that? Yeah, because I, I mean, think that's a really good piece. Well, I think the nice part about it is that we can serve a, a corrective emotional experience. So how do you, if you have an anxious parent or a parent who died, how do you correct that? And there is, you know, uh, doing visualizations where they talk back to it, whatever. But more so, 
More so is how does it affect you currently? And I do this with any history of trauma. I don't even go back and deal with whatever the trauma thing is unless the client's not getting better. Because what, you, what I do is what's the current effect? How does it affect you currently? And I have this whole talk I do called um, how versus why, where we don't talk about the why, but we talk about how. So how does it affect her daily functioning? Is she afraid to talk to certain people? What are the traits that, sh that where her anxiety or fear or upset comes out? And I try to help deal with that specifically and find um, new behaviors to pair with a positive experience. Does that make sense? <laughs> okay. Yes. He's bringing you the microphone. Yeah. Um, I work with patients, clients uh, who have morbid obesity, uh, yeah. some severe, and one day a week I do this, and it's uh, for a center for the surgical treatment yeah. of morbid obesity. And the vast majority of all the patients I see are either not educated or they do not see um, their morbid obesity condition and their eating habits as an eating disorder. And I don't really, because I, it's not, I don't have the time to kind of go into it. Uh, my job is really just to do an right. assessment to right. see if, if the patient is uh, appropriate for, their, for uh, surgery or, or if they meet psychosocial requirements, mental health requirements. Yeah, yeah. But in terms of your experience with morbid obesity and patients who have that problem, can, can you say yeah. a few uh, words? Yeah, okay, so about 50% of people, of uh, uh, obese individuals, um, meet criteria for binge eating disorder. Not all of them, only about 50%. Obesity is a medical condition. Binge eating disorder is a psychological condition. So not all people who are obese meet the criteria, and it's a very interesting criteria. Um, I've I've treated I've treated people um, I've treated binge eating disorder, and I've treated people who um, uh, are. I used to have a clinic called There Is a Healthy Way, where I treated people who are overweight, either obese or just you know overweight, wanting to lose weight. And it, it's, it is important to start to separate it out, what has an eating disorder and what isn't. And the only thing I think is important when you do these assessments for people who are going to get the surgery is what we started to see as a backlash of people who are getting the surgery for obesity is that several of them show up in treatment later with bulimia. Because what happens, and you probably heard, looks like you've heard this, they, they weren't prepared to change their eating habits at all. And so they started, they don't have room for the food. Now they eat the food and then they throw up without meaning to. It's an automatic response and they go, whoa, that was easy. And then they start doing that and we have this whole secondary. So somehow that part in the assessment of their eating habits and how they can change their eating habits and you wouldn't necessarily have to get into, there's some short screens that can kind of shortly screen for binge eating disorder, but so many of them don't, don't have it that you're looking at this whole other medical issue and how do you do it all, you know? But I think screening for that and are they able to talk to someone. I had someone who wanted to have the surgery and, and I said, I want to see this ch certain changes in your behavior before you get, well, this is someone who got liposuction and then later what happened is the areas where she didn't have liposuction, she gained weight, so she became more distorted. I've seen that also because I told her, I don't think you should do it until you change these certain behaviors, and, and she didn't do that and had the surgery. So I don't know how helpful that is, but I think we do, it's important to make the distinction between obesity and binge eating disorder because they, it's surprisingly enough, there's so much endocrine and insulin problems and so much going on that creates obesity um, that you, you can't necessarily, and everyone says, oh, it's an eating disorder, but it's not necessarily. Somebody up here? Somebody else? Yes, over there in the front. Hold on one second he, so it goes on the tape. Oh, somebody else. Then I'll come to you. Sorry. So you talked about um, anxiety being a predisposing factor to anorexia. And bulimia, but just higher in anorexia. Okay. So if 
a patient, my daughter was very young when she was treated on Prozac. Like you, she didn't want to go to school, so eventually they put her on medication. She started in second grade, and apparently the psychologist thought, the psychiatrist and psychologist thought that she had predisposing factors for possibly an eating disorder later in life. Nobody shared that with me. And my daughter went through all of her life, well, till high school, um, having increasing the Prozac for her anxiety. She goes to university, and at the end of her first year, she develops anorexia. And then we go back to the psychiatrist, and he says, yes, I knew your daughter was going to have anorexia. Well, that must have been disturbing. <laughs> that is very disturbing. Yeah. And to this day, I wonder, if someone had done something then, do you think this would have happened to my daughter? How the heck do I know, you know? <laughs> um, all I would say is we're trying to educate people now. We're trying to educate people about these traits, and if you see this, and the kinds of things to do in a family, if you do see that, um, there's a lot of, and Prozac is interesting. Uh, the initial research on Prozac was, was good for anorexia nervosa um, only after they gained weight. Once they were uh, underweight, um, it doesn't work that well. But here's what happens. As soon as they gain weight, they're like, well, why take the Prozac, you know? So the follow-up studies haven't been that, that good about Prozac because they describe it for anorexia nervosa too. I don't know. It's really hard to say. Sometimes I think, oh, if my mom only knew, you know, would I have developed anorexia if she had known? It's, it's just really hard to say. Somebody in the very front row. One more. Okay. okay. First, I want to thank you because I've been studying this for over 40 years and you gave me insight. Oh, thank you. Um, thank you. A couple things. Um, I saw a video years ago, I think it was um, some type of treatment in Canada, where they would like hold the client and feed them because yeah, a yeah. lot of them need love and I just wondered yeah. what you thought about that. It's Peggy Claude Pierre and uh, she opened a place in Canada. And actually, it was instrumental in my own um, career because I was running hospital-based programs at the time. And I always thought, man, this is not the best place to get well. I mean, the clients, who in your life goes you know, down to get your food through a cafeteria it tray? It's handed to you. It's covered up with a little metal thing. And there are people there taking notes while you eat. It was so abnormal to me. And, um, and I kept saying, we're not going to do that. And the other thing was the people in the hospital, um, the, the workers in the hospital, were not eating the same thing as the patients were eating. So when I went in and first uh, started running hospital programs, this is in the late 80s, early 90s, um, I was like, we have, to, we have to do this all differently. And um, they need so much more than that. And for one thing, they need to be able to go have exposure to the food. They need to go in the kitchen. They need to put their hand. When you're, it's like treating a phobia and saying we're going to talk about snakes all the time, but you don't, we, we don't have exposure to it. We don't, right? So what Peggy Claude Pierre did, she had two daughters, two, I think two daughters who um, had eating disorders. She helped them both, and she helped them, interestingly enough, talking about this eating disorder voice that they had. So she decided she was going to open a clinic in Canada. And I was very fascinated by this. I think she was on 60 Minutes, and they showed cars lining up to cross the border to go to her residential. And I went, that's it. I have to open a residential treatment center. And I like her book, and it was, it's interesting, and it's informed in a way. But the problem that happened was she had also no clinical training. So for example, people, for a while, I got this reputation. Oh, she, I remember someone said once, oh, she only hires people who are re recovered. And I went, First of all, well, that's not true, meaning me. And secondly, they have to be clinicians first or have skills. And then if they're recovered, you know, that's an asset. Well, well, Peggy, I think, thought that because she helped her daughters recover, she would know enough about establishing a clinic. So she opened a clinic. Unfortunately, in her book, she badmouthed the whole powers that be in the eating disorder field, so they sort of went after her. But also, she did things like a patient would discharge from her program, and she would hire them immediately right back, and they weren't prepared. And anyway, 
the part that was beautiful was there was a lot of loving care and a lot of attention and a lot of trying to understand this voice and helping talk back to the voice and things like that. Now, I certainly believe what I said about the therapeutic relationship and about how we have to be um, attentive and be this presence and be this calming force. And I think in a way why she has success, and I know people, she successfully treated two people two daughters of a woman who in in Australia started the first one of the first clinics or programs in in Australia there's no residential there yet so that's who she was and and that's what happened it is she eventually got got shut down and I've heard she's opened up in <coughs> Portugal or something like that thank, yeah. thank okay. you very much thank everybody. you so much thank you. thank you I really appreciate it